Well, good morning. good morning. So I wanted to look at this idea of life's curveballs. First one I'm throwing you is that Reverend Mark Lapotz came up with a sermon title that includes sports terminology, <laughs> baseball no less. <laughs> Now, I don't think I've met anyone who hasn't gone through at least, at least one experience of life throwing them a curveball, you know, something that was completely unexpected, something that maybe they weren't prepared to deal with. Certainly was the case with uh, John and Keith, who were on a road trip together when they got caught in a terrible blizzard. So they pulled into a nearby farm. They asked the attractive lady who answered the door if they could spend the night. She replied, you know, I realize it's terrible weather out there and I have this huge house all to myself, but I'm re recently widowed and I'm afraid the neighbors will talk if I let you stay in my house. Don't worry, says John. We'll be happy to sleep in the barn and if the weather, weather breaks, we'll be gone at first light. The lady agreed, and the two men found their way to the barn and settled in for the night. Come morning, indeed, the weather had cleared, and they got back on their journey. About nine months later, John received an unexpected letter from the attractive widow's attorney. He dropped in on his friend Keith and asked, Keith, do you remember that good-looking widow from the farm we stayed at about nine months ago? Yes, I do, says Keith. Did you um, happen to get up in the middle of the night and go up to the house and pay her a visit, asks John. Well, uh, yes, Keith says. Oh, a little embarrassed about being found out. I have to admit that I did. John then asked, and did you happen to play your little trick of giving her my name instead of yours when you left? <laughs> Keith's face turned beet red, and he said, yeah, look, I'm sorry, buddy. I'm afraid I did. Why do you ask? Well, said John, I just received this letter from her attorney. She died and left me everything. <laughs> OK, from John's point of view, there's a curveball that I think we'd all like to experience. <laughs> but in general, when we talk about life throwing us a curveball, I think we're really talking about something unexpected, unanticipated that we would never have wished for, that we would have done anything to try to avoid. And it could be anything from the small annoyances like you know, getting up to go to work and discovering that our car battery is dead to you know, really devastating, you know, life-altering, circumstances, things that just feel like a whole life has been turned upside down. You know, there's certainly those in our local community right now with these fires that we've had who are facing such devastation. And you know, one, of the, one of the basic tenets of science of mind, of our teaching, that people are really drawn to, that brings them in, that uh, they are attracted to, is this idea of the power of our minds to create and effect positive changes. You know, as we expand in consciousness, we teach, as we learn to recognize the essence of God's goodness at the center of our being, that that goodness of God is in everything and everyone, that we're not dealing with a God out there that withholds from any of us, that the more we really sense that God nature is our true nature, the more we get to experience it in our lives and our shifts in consciousness to realize more of that truth can affect all kinds of healing. You know, healing of health challenges, healing of our finances, healing of relationships, opening us up to greater self-expression. You know, when we clear our minds of the limited beliefs of 
how well, you know, this could never be, this is impossible, oh, that could never happen to me, or you know, this can never change. As we clear those kinds of limiting beliefs out of our consciousness, we manifest greater good. And so as people work with these principles, you know, as they start putting the, the practice in their lives, working with this idea of God is all there is, God is at the center of my being, and really, really engaging in the spiritual practices that help us to remember that, and they see their lives improve, you know, they, they get that, that dream job that one time they would have thought was never possible. They step into that greater experience of health. You know, they get to experience and express more love in their lives. You know, they're eager to jump on the science of mind bandwagon. But I'm going to offer this idea that there always comes a point in our spiritual evolution where we're using all the tools. We're affirming, we're praying, we're you know, journaling, we're meditating, we're doing our vision boards, we're being of service, we're tithing, we're going to see our practitioners, we're doing it all. And yet, the good that we're trying to manifest, that job, that kind of relationship, that specific salary, that cure, just isn't manifesting the way we want. And I believe this is when we're being moved to understand that you know, as wonderful as it is to manifest good in the world, good in our lives, as a matter of fact, that's our creative nature, that's what spirit seeks to do through us, the world out there is not our source. As important as it is to clear our limiting beliefs around things being impossible, and as we clear those types of uh, thoughts that we are able to manifest greater good, it's equally important for us to release the limiting mindset that says, things have to be like this for me to be happy. That's yet another way that we limit God's goodness in our lives. Our spiritual essence is not dependent on anything in the world. You know, God's nature does not depend on material conditions. And I think that there's a notion that if we're committed to our spiritual practice, if we're really doing it regularly and we're showing up at our best in the world, that life is just going to unfold and always be sweet and pleasant and rosy. And I really don't like to be the bearer of bad tidings, but I have to say, nah, -uh, not always. <laughs> it's not necessarily always going to be that way. All the great masters from all the different faith traditions have demonstrated the spiritual principles, uh, you know, the capacity we have to make changes in the world, you know, to perform miracles. They've all shown us that, but they also have demonstrated how they were not affected or dragged down by negative conditions that maybe they didn't change. If we were to study the lives of you know, two of those great masters. Just look at the life of Jesus or the life of the Buddha. <laughs> I guarantee that not every person that they met in their lives showed up as sweet and pleasant and wonderful, and they didn't just always walk into really fun and sweet circumstances. You know, as much as they demonstrated their ability to transform human conditions, from something negative into something positive. They also were our examples of not being derailed by the negative conditions of the world. They both faced very unpleasant people, if you didn't happen to know that. I mean, the Buddha was known in situations where hostile people would come his way. He would admonish his disciples 
if they got upset and angry at those people for showing up like that. You know, he kept reminding them that they were just witnessing a mind in turmoil that was temporarily acting like that, but that that wasn't those, you know, the individual's true nature. And Jesus did the same. You know, the person that tells us to love our neighbors, love ourselves, love our enemies, is basically saying there's something to love about everything and everyone, no matter how they're showing up, that the outer behavior isn't the absolute truth about anything or anyone. Both of these great masters maintained a sense of love, of compassion, of forgiveness. You know, and neither of them ended their lives in what I think is the way any of us would choose. Who would choose crucifixion as a way to end their life? And yet, up there in that moment, looking down at the very people that were putting him up there, Jesus called forth forgiveness, saying, they know not what they do. They haven't awakened. They don't really understand the error of their ways. The Buddha was poisoned. And yet, apparently, as he made his exit, it was done gracefully, just basically showing this, what you're witnessing, isn't as absolute as you think it is. Now, I remember a Buddhist teacher years back bringing up this idea that if we could, um, first of all, celebrate the ways that we're able to use our creative nature to bring forth good into the world, but if we could also really embrace the idea that the worst thing, the absolute worst thing that could happen to anyone could possibly happen to us, but that if it did, our core nature would be untouched by it, that our true spiritual self would be absolutely still perfect and whole. He said, if we could really embrace that, then that's when we would really be able to experience peace. I mean, think about it. If you knew that nothing could really harm you at your core, there'd be nothing you would have to fear. If you compare the times when something unpleasant came your way, and OK, so you didn't like it. It's not something you would have chosen. But you weren't derailed by it. You know, something happened. And you looked at it, you didn't like it, but you immediately moved forward to do something positive, to bring forth the solution, to take care of it. And you compare those times to the times that something just totally derailed you. It could be as simple as you spilled that cup of milk on the counter, but you, know, you just suddenly are completely undone by it. What's the difference in the moments where you know, the first where you were able to handle it, it's because you felt a potential within you to deal with what was at hand. Whereas the second situation, you just didn't feel that essence of God that's bigger than anything out there in the world that could deal with anything. And what we teach over and over again in Science of Mind is that none, none of our human conditions or circumstances have power over us. We can never never be robbed of our spiritual nature. Please hear that. You can never be robbed of your spiritual nature. If you recall a time when you were going through a hardship, but in the midst of that, something made you laugh, something came along and you were able to share some moment of love and kindness and caring with someone, how how is that possible if the human circumstance had power over you? It's the playfulness, the love, the joy of the divine in you was able to come forth. It was still there to come forth when you turned your attention away from the problem that you were fixated on. You know, in moments where life throws us a curveball, you know, those moments that we just feel we can't handle what life has dealt us and it's causing us pain and suffering. I say, first of all, be very compassionate with yourself. This happens to all of us. I wish I could tell you, oh, you get to a certain point and oh, after that, life's a breeze. We'll always have things that 
become our challenges to work through. But in those situations, I invite us to ask ourselves, what aspect of God's nature do I feel disconnected from as a result of this experience? Do I feel disconnected from love? Do I feel disconnected from a sense of wholeness? Do I feel disconnected from abundance or whatever? And just turn our attention inward and feel that essence of those qualities of God seeking to be more fully expressed. You couldn't feel what the greater good would be like if you were more abundant, if things were unfolding in a way where there was more love. You couldn't even feel that if those qualities of God weren't already within you. And so as we focus on that and then find ways in our day-to-day -day lives to consciously put those qualities of God into action, find a way to give and receive some love, find a way to bring a little bit of lightheartedness to something. Find a way to be generous if you're feeling depleted. Just There's always a way to give of ourselves, give compliments to people, give lots of smiles to people on the street. There's always a way to express that essence. And as we do that, as we realize that those aspects of God's nature are still right there at the center of our being, we then open to new ways to experience and express them. So I feel compelled once again to share how my mom was probably one of my greatest teachers along the way. And certainly she demonstrated this principle to me. You know, She was a woman who absolutely loved, she loved being part of our lives. But my mom's worst nightmare was to ever think that she would be a burden to any of her family, to anyone. And with that nightmare in mind, she had a stroke that left her completely physically paralyzed and seriously speech impaired. And of course, you know, when it happened, we all prayed for her full recovery. You know, she and all of us just couldn't imagine her being happy, being, you know, feeling well, unless she made a full recovery. And she did indeed make a remarkable recovery from being completely paralyzed to being able to get around and ambulate, but it was in a wheelchair. So she was confined to a wheelchair. She still had a lot of challenges with her speech. And let me tell you, this was a woman who used to read the dictionary and the thesaurus for fun. So to have that kind of a challenge, and yet as we all accepted, including her of course, the human situation as it was, and let go of the idea that her happiness was dependent on that full recovery. The essence of her love, of her playfulness, of her nurturing nature came through. You know, she was dependent on caregivers, and yet she found ways to care for them. You know, here they were in a place where they were basically ta taken for granted by most of the residents. And yet my mom was the one to ask about their families, to know everything about their lives, to give them little gifts in any way she could. I was told that at night when there would be only one caregiver on duty and they had an area where they could rest and sleep when things were quiet, she would wheel herself out there in the middle of the night and look around and if they weren't sleeping, she would tell them, Go, go, rest. You know, very soon, every caregiver in that place was calling her mamacita and treating her like their own mom. Now, I know that despite that huge curveball, you know, that we would never have wished for, we would never have wished for her to have that stroke, I can know that her last years were still filled with love and joy. Why? Because she opened up to the divine essence within and let it flow out despite her circumstances. So let's just recognize, yes, life sometimes throws us curveballs on our journey, things we're not feeling prepared to deal with. But if we turn to our God nature really sense it within us to deal with those issues, 
if we face them with that level of consciousness, we can absolutely face those curveballs and knock them out of the park. Let's pray. <laughs> Thank you. And so let's take this moment to just turn within and recognize the presence of that one life, that one power, that one infinite invisible that I call God, that is goodness in every way it can be known, felt, and realized. That we feel every moment as the impulse within us to be happy, to be well, to be free of any kind of challenge or difficulty. This one and all its goodness is present fully and equally throughout creation, including in and as me and every being here, every being everywhere. And knowing this, I speak my word, knowing that if there's any area in our lives where we feel challenged, where we feel something has come our way that just seems difficult, painful, we remember right here, right now, the presence of the divine that is greater than any circumstance we face, and we know it is there to be called forth and to make good of anything that is. We absolutely hold that idea for those in our community who are affected by the fires right now, who have been displaced, who have faced loss. And we absolutely know that God is with them. We let this prayer be a prayer for our families, our loved ones, for situations in the world that call to our attention, knowing that God is always right at the center of each and every one of these situations. And as we know that, good is revealed. We bless our church. We bless all churches everywhere, synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, all paths to God. And I know that we are absolutely healed and uplifted by coming together today and so in gratitude for all this good, for the good that God is always, I release this word knowing it is so, I let it be, and so it is. And together we say, Amen.